this week's a weekend watch then kindly sponsored by sbk hopefully myself and uh, daryl carter and andrew mount can help you find some winners this weekend and uh, give us some good stats that I'm sure they've dug up for us as well. They always seem to help, don't they? Uh, Ascot and Lingfield and Haydock are going to be the main focuses for us this week. So we'll start with Ascot. But before that, I'll just have a quick recap on last week. Because, of course, with the social media blackout, we were always going to have lots of winners. Um, so uh, my nap and, and Daryl really fancied starting, which I think we gave it about 33s, went off 18 to 1. That was a good winner. Uh, Dawn Deeper was a winner as well for Andrew. Big prize, 13 to 2 ish. Uh, in, on Daryl's Gigi column as well. Uh, five selections, four winners. So it worked out really well. We had a good weekend and all of those horses as well, given a real positive mention by Daryl. So I hope plenty of you uh, followed uh, all of those in. I just wanted to mention as well, weather's a bit unpredictable, isn't it, this weekend? I think we are forecast quite a bit of rain Saturday. That would obviously affect results and possibly selections as well. So as always, we may update uh, closer to the time or even on the day, I'm sure Daryl and Andrew as well, they put plenty on their personal um, pages, which you can look out for in case they change their mind or if something doesn't run. So as always, we'll do our best to, to keep you in the loop. Uh, back to Ascot though. The 155 is a class two handicap over a mile for the Phillies. Uh, Dream Laper, I thought, would have a really solid chance in this. Look progressive last season. Uh, got no run whatsoever in the race at Haydock that I actually fancied Fox Champion, who also got no run. Uh, and I thought that that run suggested that uh, an open mark at the minute of 91 shouldn't be too far away from her. She's back in against the girls. Um, I think she should take a fair bit of beating. So I quite like the look of Dream Loper in there. Um, Daryl, do you want to start? Yeah, but come on. How how have you not taken up a, a whole minute on your 33 to 1 winning nap last week? Oh, I don't want to blow my own. Come on. You've got to celebrate that. That was unbelievable. To nap it was, was excellent. So fair well, play to you. you. <laughs> uh, yeah, 155. Uh, the weather is. Um, I've spent too much time on this race. It's one of those races where I thought I had it sussed the moment I looked at it, and then I started going through a bit, bit longer, bit longer, uh, and I started uh, putting myself off a lot of horses. To be honest, rather than putting myself onto a lot of horses, um, the weather is going to play right havoc this weekend. I think um, yeah. it, it, we're due a, a, a deluge of rain, if you like. That won't suit Dream Loper. I think she wants top of the ground um, conditions. She's definitely well handicapped off a of mark of 91. That that Haydock run is probably the strongest piece of form in the race. It was against the boys, back into Philly's only company this time. Um, she's got to have a massive chance. I do like it. I'd prefer it if she was actually over seven, um, especially if the rain comes in. And so that just just worries me a bit. Um, you could mention you can give a good mention to a couple in here. Perfect inch um, was only done by a neck. By uh by Dream Loper on her, on Dream Loper's penultimate start at Ascot over course and distance, uh, so she's not got too much to find. She really wants a, a stiff track like Ascot. I, I think she wants to step up and trip. Um, I can see why they put the cheek pieces on Perfect Inch. She just doesn't look like she's putting it all in for me. Um, so that would just be a slight concern. But there's form lines that intertwine quite a lot of these. The the, the horse I'm going to side with over uh, Dream Loper is actually this uh, uh, Conservatoire. For William Haggis, uh, really steadily progressive last year. Uh, over trips, probably short of what she actually wants. I think she's going to be a, a stay in Philly. Um, she did very well in heavy ground twice. Uh, the second time, notably, when, when just really showing a gutsy attitude to get up and beat Sir Maxi. Uh, she's off a mark of uh, of 86. She's up four pounds for, for finishing second at, at Newcastle in the last scene. Now she's lacks a run um, but Haggis did win this race a couple of years ago uh, and I just really like the attitude of this horse just really gets her head down and, and just keeps galloping all the way to the line if she's fit enough to do her justice do herself justice here I think this track will really suit she won't be stopping at the finish and uh, yeah I quite like her going forward she's a three year old three year old's not got the best record in it must be said one for 16 in the last 10 years but uh there's something about this horse I just quite like. I love the attitude. I love the way she'll grind for you. And, uh, yeah, there's a question mark over a few of these uh, in here in terms of attitude. So, uh, conservatoire for me. Yeah, fiery fillies um, in the 155. Um, I have to say as well, just to mention, conservatoire, obviously very little weight to carry. Really good to see Liam Jones as well back. Obviously, he's had a, he had a bad fall and then was just plagued with a few different things, I think. So, um, really good to see that he's you know back on track and, and back doing what, what he loves. That's a positive. And I would never like to argue with Daryl, but I do just want to say that we've not tried Dream Loper on soft ground yet. So you can't knock a horse 
that they won't like it if they've never been tried on it. I think she's only, I think the worst she's got is, is good ground, isn't it, and good to burn. So we'll see, but I know what you mean. You'd prefer to know already, wouldn't you? Um, so Dream Loper for me, Conservatoire off the featherweight, eight stone three for Daryl. And Andrew, are you going to make it more complicated? Uh, no, I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to side with you, Leona, and uh, Dream Loper. This is a horse I wanted to be against when she made her debut at Haydock. I thought seven furlongs round a turn wasn't going to suit. She was pretty free and fresh on her seasonal reappearance. Um, since her race course debut, she's had three runs on straight tracks, um, two wins and a place. I think the straight track is the key, um, perhaps rather than the ground. Obviously, we don't know. She hasn't raced on softer than good, but um, there's not um, loads more rain forecast between now and Saturday and um, you know with uh, a drying wind as well we might see a bit like Chester today on Thursday at the time of recording things have dried out quite quickly um, as, as for the three-year-old stats don't worry about that if you go back um, to the start of this race it's um, I think it's two wins for three-year-olds from only 24 representatives and um, the expected number of winners was like 1.78 so basically three and four-year-olds win as expected in this race um, more importantly is the running style. Um, you look at the last 14 renewals, 10 of the winners were ridden patiently. So it's, really you want something that's not going to be up with the pace. And um, I'd also be wary of backing last time out winners, just one from 24 in this contest. So, uh, you know, I, I had sort of Dream Loper, Conservatoire as the two on my short list. Uh, Willie Haggis does really well in Philly's handicaps in general. You can make a profit back here in these conditions. As Daryl said, he won the race in 2018. And um, yeah, the the uh, penultimate time it was run. So we yeah, had Dream Loper over Conservatoire for me. Okay, uh, we seemed to do well last week when we agreed. So let's hope that uh, uh, goes on to this weekend. Uh, next up at Ascot, we got that two thirty. The Buckhounds listed stakes and talking to Willie Haggis, he's got uh, Roberto Escobar uh, in this, and, and they've entered that one in the Hardwick and in the Coronation Cup, which I think speaks plenty for this horse. Um, he absolutely batted, didn't he, Matthew Flanders last year? That horse is now 89. Uh, I think there's loads more to come from, from this Roberto Escobar. He was 11 to 2 as well the next time out for a Group 2. Now, obviously, into a handicap, he's about 11 to 2. Um, I don't think ran too badly. He's had his win tinkered with as well. I think loads of um, positives for Roberto Escobar in uh, what looks like a fairly difficult uh, race. Uh, Andrew, do you want to start? Yeah, tricky one. Um, there were sort of three on the sort of long short list at this stage. Uh, Albal Flora for uh, Rafe Beckett. And the, the one I liked the most was uh, Deja for uh, Peter Chapel Hyam, who's just basically ground dependent. Um, good to soft or softer, all the all weather. Five wins uh, from eight starts, a second from one of those defeats. Good or faster, bombed out with two unplaced efforts. Uh, say Albal Flora back in trip uh, and, uh, uh, from a mile six, but the ground will suit as will the track. Yeah, having won here on the final start, um, so having won here last year, and Gold Maze, Roger Varian's got a really good record in this race. So I thought Gold Maze uh, had his ground, and um, you know was a possibility as well. But it's yeah, it's, it's a tricky one for in terms of betting. I wouldn't really want to go um, sort of too strong at this stage. I'd want to have a better look at the race on the day, and uh, particularly see how the track had ridden on Friday. But Generally speaking, what we see on the round course at Ascot is you don't want to be leading towards that inside rail. You often want to be tracking the pace, coming from midfield or further back and coming down the middle of the track. So we'll get some more clues on Friday. But at this stage, I'd just go with Deja for Peter Chapel Hyam. I think he's around about 8-1. to one. Yeah, he's a great trader, isn't he, Peter Chapel Hyam? Obviously, don't have the the horses that he used to but uh, Deja on for me is about 17 to 2 at the moment pleased to see I said Roberto Escobar was about 11 to 2 not anymore 8 to 1 so uh, definitely sticking with that um Darryl? Yeah, I thought this was pretty straightforward. I thought uh, without a fight we'll give that Al Assi form a good boost here. Um it without a fight ran a really nice race here. I was planting the start behind uh, Berkshire Rocco but they went so slowly from the off um, and he just sort of had to sit and suffer in a, in a small tactical race, which just didn't really suit him. Finished under a hands and heels ride there. Um, Alba Flora actually finished in, th in front of him, but uh, I think without a fight, he's definitely a strong stayer, a progressive horse on the up. Um, I don't really see there being too many dangers in here, to be honest with you. I don't, I'm not entirely convinced Roberto Escobar wants this sort of trip. I thought uh, Alunak had the strongest piece of form on offer uh, with, 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 a hard with a hard wick run last year, um, but Again, that one's uh, 
uh, lacking a bit of race fitness and has previously needed the run. Um, I, I just I don't really see I really don't see the danger unless this gets into a gets to a bog um, and and we do see loads and loads of rain then um, I'd be wary of Deja but uh, other than that I'd, I don't know how I think this should be a fifteen to eight shot not a three to one shot so uh, yeah without a fight for me. Well, I'm getting worried here that we all have quite strong views and all <laughs> uh, different ones. Uh, so without a fight for Daryl, uh, I'm with Roberto Escobar and Andrew Deja at the moment. So we'll see what obviously happens with the rain, as we say, because it does make a great deal of difference to uh, opinions. Uh, the 3.40 and at the moment just the 29 runners at the time of recording to troll through uh, for the Victoria Cup. As I said earlier, I'm, I'm sticking with him, Fox champion. Uh, I think he'd have been a lot closer and, you know, may have nearly won had he had better luck at Haydock. So I'm not going to jump ship. Uh, I think he looks really well treated on best form for the Hannans. And I think uh, a strongly run seven is going to be what he wants. So I stick with Fox champion. Daryl? Oh, I, 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 I like Coughlin here, but um, I really like quite a big, big price in here. I like um, Walhan. Nap uh, it, nap it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not going to nap it, but uh, I, I do really, really like him. He switched to the James Tate yard uh, and the booking of Hayley Turner just catches the eye. She rides his course extremely well, this straight Ascot course. Um, she's only had four runs for him. I think she finished one up twice. Um, but this horse was with uh, Ian Williams last year. Obviously, took him a couple of runs to, to work out what to do with the horse. Uh, he ran at Ascot over, uh, at this course over seven furlongs uh, behind River Nymph, beaten two lengths. Now, um, he was... <laughs> He was given River River Nymph um, thirteen pounds that day. River Nymph was a three-year-old, of course, getting the allowance. He was given him thirteen pounds. The winner, River Nymph, who's in this race today, is now sixteen pounds higher, um, and the selection is now twenty-three pounds better off of him. So that's a big, big swing at the weights. And he caught the eye at Stewards that day, not being given a, a hard enough time to, to get to get to the winning line, I, I suggest. Uh, he went out of York next time out and uh, he was drawn right in the car park and stall 14. Uh, came home, caught the eye, beating four lengths by Montatham. Um, then he runs again at Ascot uh, in, a, in a race that turned into a little bit of a tactical affair behind Tempest, uh, beating uh, one and a half lengths. Tempest is, is a pretty useful horse. I quite fancied him for the, for the Cambridgeshire last year. But he got drawn in stall one. Uh, he had absolutely no chance. Anything that raced on that on the, on the far side of the track finished. Well, I'll tell you, he won the group on that side of the track, first to seven, beaten thirteen lengths they were. Um, but in second was um, Sabaska. Uh, behind him was Sabaska and Montatham. Obviously, both rated one hundred and eleven and uh, one hundred and ten or one hundred and thirteen, something like that. Um, and then I just thought he wasn't suited by the way the way the race was run at Leicester on his final start last season. Uh, I just think you can put a line through that. I just think this horse is a nearly horse all the time. It, the draw's just not done him any favours in big races off of marks in and around 90 to 92. I think he won't mind if any rain gets involved. I think seven furlongs is definitely his trip. I strongly run seven furlongs. Uh, he's well handicapped on the bare form of his runs this season. He is, he is seriously well handicapped. I just hope he gets the breaks because he can be a hostage to fortune. But with Hayley Turner on, I think she she rides the track really really well, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, I, I think he's got got a fantastic chance. I really really do. Uh, yeah, so well hand. I, I was I was having an iron about like Chief of Chiefs. Um, I think he's got a good chance. Uh, and the other one was obviously acquitted, who I've been waiting. I think they've probably been waiting uh, for a race like this after his uh, after his seasonal return. Yeah. So yeah, he won't mind what the rain does, but I can't get away from what uh, from Wellhan. He's twenty odd to one, so I think he's got. I think he's got a great chance. I really do. You think Stall Ten will be okay because you can kind of pick where you go then? Yeah, yeah, exactly. For, for once, he's got in a decent stall straight in the centre, and they, you know she can choose where she wants to go with him rather than being forced. To, I mean, yeah. if you look at that Newmarket Cambridge run, like the far side group, thirteen lengths behind anything yeah, that raced on the near side. Yeah, you got no chance, and he and he won that side of the group with two decent horses, Montatham and and Sebuska. And he wasn't too far behind those horses either uh, in the city of York, York Stakes when he was drawn out in the car park and stall fourteen. The only horses in, at York, in, in, sorry, in the Clipper Stakes, the only horses that finished in front of him from double figure draws at York were Sebuska and Top Rank. They're the only two that finished above him in in, in those double figures draws. So, yeah. I think he's I think he's well handicapped, and um, I think everything could just fall right for him, providing he's fit and well first time up. You know, there are obviously negatives. He's a twenty to one shot, but he's got to have a big chance, surely. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, Will Horn, as you say, yeah, 20 to 1. Um, Daryl? Um, yep, yeah, um, Daryl can go again if he likes. But, um, <laughs> you, might need, you might need Luke again. <laughs> yeah, so oh, uh, typically tricky. I mean, at the first Ascot meeting, it looked to be an advantage to be drawn high and race towards this, uh, the near side rail. We saw, oh, um, oh this is us, 66 to 1. Yeah. Challenge close to the rail. Patek side, drawn high, challenge close to the rail. Um, slightly different ground for this two-day meeting starting on Friday, but at least Friday's action will give us some clues. I mean, if you look at this race historically, you know, generally speaking, you want to be very high or very low, but it has been a bit all over the shop at times. Um, interesting ones are headed by um, Queso, who was uh, a close third off a higher mark in this race a couple of years ago. Last year, it didn't work out for him. He's only had the two runs, and um, we haven't seen him again after June, after a flop at Royal Ascot. He's got some great form over course and distance. As I placed in this race before, he had a pipe opener at Newcastle the other day. He doesn't handle the all-weather at all, so you can draw a line through that. So Queso um, was interesting. Um, acquitted, who was second um, in, in the spring mile at uh, Doncaster behind uh, Artistic Rifles, who is very, very good. I mean, he did have the race run to suit, and then he was held up into the headwind, unlike the winner. But at least he's got the right running star for Ascot coming from off the pace. And I think the most interesting one for me was the um, Richard Hughes horse, Carabana. Uh, he ran in a race at um, Newbury last September behind Epic Endeavour. There was a monster pace bias at Newbury on the straight track that day, even more so than usual. If you weren't leading all, you know, in the first couple throughout, you were stuffed. And uh, Caravan has finished second of 17 after coming from off the pace. And you go through that race and you look at some of the other holder horses. You've got runners in 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 10th, 14th, have all won since at least once, you know, shortly afterwards. Um, it's great form to finish where he did, given that running style. Uh, he's been gelded since we last saw him. And uh, he's going to be held on to, you would imagine, given that you know, that's his typical running style. So Caravana would be my pick. So, um, K so also of interest. Um, so just anything beginning with K, really, that'll uh, narrow it down. <laughs> Probably be Kaiser Sozo, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, Kaiser, actually, Kaiser Sozo is interesting because he's normally ridden off from off the pace. He was a, he was a horse Jamie Spencer often got criticized for sort of getting there too late on. Uh, they chucked him in an apprentice race here, um, the other day, and uh, he's raced prominently and, and he's won. But he is drawn on the far side. And, you know, again, I've, I've not done a pace map for the race yet, so I don't know where the pace is in this particular contest. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's a tricky one, as we expect. Yeah. Um, there's a horse in here as well. He used to ride out a little bit, and I absolutely loved him. And I don't know whether he's just never been as good as Henry thought he would. Greenside, if you get a chance on Saturday when we see that, he's an absolute tank, mm -hmm. and then he's massive, and he's really well, stocky, but... He's one of my um, yeah. He's one of my regular horses that um, you know I, I often back, and I, I have got a, a theory about him, which uh, um, I'm just trying to yeah. Eleven or fewer runners. That was always my sort of feeling with Greenside. He, he tends to struggle in very big fields, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see how he gets on. Hopefully, yeah. they split into two or more groups. He ends up racing with only a handful. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't want his side to win though, because mine's coming out as <laughs> stall number two. So. Maybe not. Um, okay, so loads in there, and I'm sure there'll be more fancies close to the time. Uh, anything else for either of you at Ascot? Um, bear with me. Oh, yeah, um, in the 4.15, a horse called Luganini, uh, Roger Charlton, who, who likes soft ground, basically useless on sort of, you know, good or quicker. Very, very good on anything slower, so as long as it doesn't dry out too much, he'll go well in the 4.15. And in the 450, there's a um, big field sprint handicap, highly sprung for Les Air was interesting. Um, I mean, at that Pontefract meeting last week, it was, uh, if you weren't leading, you didn't win, as simple as that. I yeah. thought they might go forward on him as he has made the running in the past, but they decided to hold on to him. He was last on turning in. He's ended up finishing second, uh, beaten three lengths, but that was a huge effort given the track bias. So yeah, maybe, maybe highly sprung in the 450 can go well. Okay, now uh, not for the minute. I've got a couple. I've got my eye on, but obviously weather weather dependent on it. So yeah, well there'll be horses as well. I suppose this weekend and going forward that have got well handicapped running on this firm ground or good ground, and then we'll have rain and no one. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, over to Lingfield. Then we got to the Oaks Trial Billy Stakes at two fifteen, and uh, Aidan O'Brien and John Gosden have a really good record in this race. Both have got live chances. Um, fifteen of the last seventeen have only won once before, so that rules a couple of these out for us but not many 
Um, and I think plenty of the, the winners recently as well, they're, they're normally single figures, aren't they? So this race doesn't throw uh, up that much of a surprise uh, very often. Um, Daryl, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, we're keen to be against the top of the market here. I thought Technique was good at Epsom, um, beating Worko, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I just didn't like the race as a whole, to be honest with you. And uh, there was a lot finishing close together uh, in a short space of time at the finish. Uh, I just didn't really like it. I, I wanted to be against Nash Nasher as well. Um, this this uh, last, twice, last twice winner. Um, I think she's got a real soft ground action, so any rain will definitely h- help her. But I thought she was flat at Sandown. She had experience against two... Um, debutants that finished behind her and she had the rail um, to help her at Sandown and it's not a, it's not an easy place to go for, for debutants at Sandown with the undulations there so um, I wanted to be against her. Loving Dream was the one I liked for um, John Gosden. Uh, second to Noonstar last time. Now there's a form line through Noonstar that ties uh, uh, Ocean Road in but uh, I just like the way this Loving Dream was finishing off her race. Definitely screamed like she wanted to go up uh, up, up uh, in distance um, and I love the way she strode out of the finish line under Rob Havlin there's, there's not really much more to it than that for me um, I couldn't really find any angles for any sort of form lines in this race but uh, John Gosden knows what it takes to win this race so I was quite keen on um, loving dream Frankie Dottori providing Frankie Dottori fancies it God he's been winding me up a lot lately I'll tell you never back Frankie <laughs> Dottori each way just the word of the voice, never back him each way. All or nothing. He either wins he's, or he just can't be bothered. Yeah, a hundred percent. He give if he's if things are not going his way, he quite easily chucks yeah. his toys out of his pram. It's yeah. so frustrating to, to back him. But uh he's the new this is a prominent user. runner. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a prominent runner, so we'll know about a furlong out if uh, she's she's dealing with a with chance and he's gonna be given everything. If not, he'll uh, he'll be thinking about his next ride, I suspect. Yeah. Um, I actually liked Ocean Road for that, actually, I thought, for Qatar Racing. Um, I think she could, could progress forward. Look, showed a real good uh, change of gear, and obviously she's she should get a lot further. I think she's going to be a nice horse, like the look of her. So I go for Ocean Road probably in that personally. Um, Andrew? Um, yeah, no strong opinion. I was quite interested in Divinely, though, for Aidan O'Brien, because um, she ran in Group 1 company on a final start last year. I've only found two horses in this race. Who, uh, who prepped in a group uh, a group contest? Cassiodora, who won it in two thousand and five, and Dinah Waltz in two thousand and ten. So, uh, so yeah, two from two from for horses who ran in group races last time out. So yeah, so maybe that the fact that Divinely was thought good enough to contest that group one contest at the Curra last time, you know, maybe marks her up as one to side with. I know people have been a bit sort of um, negative about some of the Aidan O'Brien runners in Britain um, this year, but we've just seen. Japan win at Chester, and it's it's been a fairly small sample size, all in all. But uh, yeah, I mean, at round about ten to one as well, she seems a bigger price than you'd expect from most O'Brien runners. Um, so yeah, divinely gets a very very tentative step. Yeah, we wouldn't talk about yard ball or anything like that because we know how much it gets. Oh yeah, Collins is on flying at the moment. Oh yeah, Collins is on now flying, isn't he? Hey, I will tell you what. That 12-day break in the season must have turned everything around. Uh, it was only a couple of weeks ago. O'Brien was flying as well over in Ireland. As soon as he comes over to Britain, oh, my God, he's out of form. I've got to, I've got to say that Colin Tizard had three winners, so they are going well now. Just to annoy Daryl. <laughs> Um, but talking of horses not being well, etc. So we've got that 250 at Lingfield, the Derby trial stakes, and sadly we're not seeing high definition, are we? So that is that Aidan O'Brien said the Bloods weren't 100% right on Wednesday evening, I think. So they're not, you know, they're not happy. They haven't gave a future target. They've said they'll obviously wait and see until um, he's right. But it can give us plenty more clues for for the next batch of classics. Do either of you have a fancy in that? And the 250. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like scope for Rafe Beckett. Um, I mean, his two previous runners in this race both ran second, 14 to 1 and 7 to 4. He's, he's better known as a horse who wins the uh, the Oaks trial rather than the Derby trial. But as I said, he hasn't had many runners in this race. He does really well at this meeting in, ge- in general. If you backed all his Lingfield runners on the turf course in the month of May, seven winners from 33 and a profit of over 39 quid to a one pound level stake. That's going back to uh, the start of this century. So yeah, I thought Scope, who um, caught the eye last time out at Newmarket, finishing second, coming from off the pace, you know, on that track that generally... so it, far it, back. That's right, it fav- yeah. favours front runners. I, I know it wasn't the day one of the meeting when the bias was particularly strong, you know, but the winner was um, prominent throughout. 
And I mean, Adeyaz, the obvious one after that Sandown defeat when he blew the start. And, uh, you know, again, the winner and third were up there throughout. And he's done best with the hold up horses by some way. But that's reflected in his price around about five to four, 11 to eight. Scope at something like seven or eight to one would be more interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I like Kiprios for this. I watched the replay early of that cork one. I just thought he doesn't look the most straightforward, does he? It was rolling about all over the place and then was really idle in front, I thought. And I just wonder whether they put them cheap pitches on. I wonder whether we've seen anywhere near the best of, of Kiprios yet. So I thought he'd perhaps be um, worth taking. I think he's second favourite, isn't he? He'd be worth taking a chance on, possibly for me, in those first time cheap pieces for uh, Ryan Moore and Aidan O'Brien. Either of those for you, Daryl? Uh, scope, actually, yeah. Uh, I thought I quite like the way he did things at, at Newmarket. Uh, didn't look to handle the track on that occasion either, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, he, he hung slightly to the, to the right. Uh, he just got a little bit outpaced and just stayed on really nicely. He was really eye catching the time before at Newbury and heavy ground as well. He's, he's a lovely looking horse. I tell you, he's, he's a really good looking horse. Um, he's got a good attitude, and, and I like that. I, I thought he might. Um, Actually, just I know he was out. I just said he was outpaced at Newmarket, but I think he bumped into a decent one there under a penalty. They were both under a penalty the first and second. Uh, but I think he might just be a little bit quicker than some of these. Um, and I thought Adaya at Sandown just took forever to pick up. Yeah. Just I felt like I was watching that final two furlongs for, for ages. And uh, uh, yeah, and I just thought Scope had a little bit more, bit, little bit more pace about him. I thought he definitely would improve for the step up and trip. It just looks so raw to me. And I just think there's plenty more to come from Scope. Um, I thought third round was interesting as well. But uh, yeah, apart from that, I wasn't. I don't think I'm going to have a bet in the race, to be honest. But uh, Scope would definitely be my selection. Um, do you think that uh, the Aidan O'Brien horses, the, th- the three-year-olds and the two-year-olds that have been coming over, that is a, it's a first-time they, travel thing? They, and they've not been what they thought. I, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, you know, when these young horses travel over the, for the first time, it's, you know, it's never yeah, a guarantee they're going to produce the same thing. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? So, yeah, it, it's interesting that Adrian mentioned, mentioned that Japan's just won at, won at Chester. I know he's dropping back into a group three there, but uh, that's a horse that's travelled all over the place, you oh, know. Mm. Yeah, I don't know the horse. So, yeah, just something to, to bear in mind, I think, when you're looking at these Aiden O'Brien free rolls, because they're always short in the market, no matter what, they do, what they've done. So, yeah. it, it's just worth keeping in mind. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree. It is it a big thing for them. Um, Travelling over um, that four o'clock at Lingfield as well. Uh, a big, uh, well, big class three handicap there. Uh, small field, unfortunately. There was quite a few entries, but just uh, four left at the moment. Um, and we've currently got the, the younger legs at the head of the market, Andrew. Yeah, I, um, I quite like this um, little race. Was it, like you say, only four runners, but we've got plenty of pace with Assad and Love Dreams. And uh, the one I like is James Fanshawe's turn on the charm, who um, didn't have the race run to suit at Nottingham last time. Nottingham on the round course, nine times out of ten, you want to be low drawn and prominent around the inside. Hard to come from off the pace. Um, and I just thought that, yeah, turn on the charm, who was a, a, an eye catcher against the pace bias at Kempton last year. I thought there's plenty more to come from this one. And despite the small field, this race could be run to suit. So I'll, I'll side with uh, James Fanshawe's runner. Uh, I think, uh, is, is he favourite? Yeah, six to yeah. four. Yeah, no, nothing to write home about, but uh, yeah, I thought he'd uh, had an obvious chance here. Yeah, we don't pick the prices, can't help it. Um, no? Turn on the charm, yeah. Empty the empty the wheelbarrow on this one. Absolutely <laughs> good thing. Good yeah. thing off a of mark of eighty-eight. Don't want the ground to get too soft, uh, but um, yeah, this this horse is. Uh, I mean, the only sort of blip, if you like, 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 like last time at Noskin behind Astro King, obviously that form's worked out really well. We highlighted that a couple of weeks ago. Finer Sounds come out of one, Nuggets come out, come out of one, the Spring Mile. Um, obviously very strong form there, but uh, didn't get the clearest of runs there either that day. Uh, the time before at Red Car, raced on the wrong side of the track um, in soft ground, but uh, made up considerable ground towards the, towards the finish and, and moved over to the, towards the uh, towards the rail where the main action was. Um, prior to that, Nottingham looked really, really decent when beating a, a couple of decent yardsticks and Sword Beach and it can. Um, yeah, this horse is just improving, improving, improving. And um, William Buick is no negative to be on board. So, yeah, <laughs> turn on the charm. 
I mean, this is the best horse in the race, turn on the chart. That, that it's as plain and simple as that. And the fact that there's yeah. plenty of pacing from the likes of a sad and love dreams and Ian College. I mean, they're all good horses in their own right. They are they are gonna run up to a level because the likes of Love Dreams is, love seven furlongs. Eaton College is, you know, a bit in and out, but on it on his day is a decent horse. So yeah, I think this is a it's a tricky little race, but providing it, it, it goes straight forward in terms of pace and that turn on the charm is definitely the best horse in this race, should be winning this. Yeah, I wondered as well whether they perhaps thought that that was a proper pipe opener last time at Nottingham because Turn on the Charm's normally quite well fancied for like the whole of last year and then he was 9-1 to one when he had his first of the season. So I thought, wonder if they just thought as well he might perhaps need it. So uh, that's a positive. Uh, anyway, anything else at Linkfield for either of you? Um, the, uh, oh, go on, go on, Andrew. Yeah, I was just going to say that yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the listed race, um, uh, Moore, Moore, the... Um, uh, the Beckett runner um, in the in the Chartwell Phillies race, but um, sixteen to one. He's only had one runner in this race before that one placed. Uh, I thought she could go well. Carol, no. yeah, same race for me. Hubal, I wanted just to give a mention to um, blinkers on first time. Ryan Moore booked for for, for Kevin Ryan. Uh, this horse is. I've been waiting for this horse to drop back to seven furlongs for what feels like a bloody age. Um, but uh, it wasn't disgraced uh, on return and listed race at Kempton after 200 day break. That was the first start for the yard in first time cheek pieces. Uh, obviously, they switched out for the blinkers. Ryan Moore's on board, dropped back to seven furlongs. I think this horse is uh, is well treated. Um, she's not. Um, She's sorry, not well treated. She's in a group three. Uh, she's got a little bit to find on the ratings, but uh, I do think there's a little bit more to come from her. And I think return to Lingfield uh, will really suit her. Now she ran really nice race, a real nice race on the Lingfield all weather uh, back in at the front end of last year um, in, in a decent race there. Just got absolutely no run. So we know she handles the course. I think she's been overlooked a little bit. She's 33 to one shot. So um, I think this race is asking for a little bit of an upset. So it's interesting. Me and Andrew have gone for the two outsiders in the race. Yeah, um, and I'm being very thick, guys. Sorry, I did them the wrong way around. We were supposed to do the chart well, Phillies, and then that four o'clock. But it's fine. We've covered them both. Um, <laughs> that's it at Lingfield then. And then we've got the one from Haydock, haven't we? That uh, Potemps Network uh, Swinton Handicap Hurdle. Um, I've got a big price in here. I'm doing it again. My nap goes in this race. Can um, I guess it? Can we guess yeah, it? Yeah. Is it the Evan Williams horse, um, no. Bell Sinker? Darryl, you have a guess. Come on. All right. Is it Cormier? Cormier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just there to say it. Um, he's about 20 to 1, I think, at the moment, and he was a bit bigger. Um, if you remember when he beat Fabwa, of course, that horse has won four or five since then and is rated 143, four, five, something like that. Um, comes here fresh off a mark of 130. I think both of those last runs last year, whether they'd gone to the well too many times and they were slowly run races and he gets held up and I just thought I could make a few excuses for him. So I think if Cormier is, is kind of, you know, half ready to go enough, uh, that one will at least run into a place at about 20 to 1. So Cormier for me. Uh, Daryl, you can start. We know how much you love your jumping, so you can go first. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I've, sto- I've slowly I've transitioned um, oh, you any, you not, not, not as a man to have, <laughs> in, into the flat racing now uh, but uh, yeah I looked at this race and I wasn't overly impressed but uh, like Andrew said a minute ago Belinska is the one I did come down on Evan Williams got a fantastic record in this race he's really unexposed um, and I think you can make a couple of excuses for him the last couple of times. Um, he, he actually beat Belfast Bentner on his point-to-point, would you believe it? Um, he's just had some tough tasks the last twice in the Betfair Hurdle and the Greatwood. He did well in the latter, the Greatwood, uh, from the front end, setting up a really good gallop. Uh, I think this has probably been a target for quite some time. The handicap, handicap has been quite quick to relent, dropping four pounds down to a mark of one, two, six, despite recording his best career, best RPRs and time figures. Um, so yeah, I'd say he's better than a mark of 126. Adam Wedge on board. Uh, obviously, Copperless. We should mention at the top of the market. This horse fell when travelling really strongly last time, and almost I think anyone with a pair of eyes would have said that this horse would have won at Aintree. Yeah. But uh, I've got a funny feeling that we're going to get uh, this this ground at Haydot is going to turn quite quite deep, and it's going to be quite a quite a test and, and Coppolis is just un, untried if you like on this sort of ground and that would just worry me and the way the handicap has reacted to the couple, the three at the top of the market is just a bit strange Rhoda Ward's up £10 um, for you know for winning that race Comprend went up what £9 for finishing second 
you know, Coppolis is effectively up ten pound without the claim on board now. It's just a weird race, and then you've got the likes of Hooper, who's who's climbing up the um, handicap for beating not a lot really. The finding battle was disappointing last time. I just think again, it's a race like you say uh, to have a bash at something, uh, a double figure yeah, price right. at the outside. Yeah. Okay, Valinska uh, at the minute is uh, sixteen to one. Um, Andrew. Yeah, um, but Belinska, although uh, uh, my glasses are dirty, I, I thought it read as ball sinker, but uh, maybe it's just because <laughs> just because I've been watching the snooker this week that uh, I was thinking of that. But yeah, as Daryl said, uh, Evan Williams has got a great record in the Swinton. Um, his, his first six runners in this race were, were all beat, but um, in recent years, his last nine, four of one and four have placed. Um, so you make a good profit. Uh, of all the all the fifteen runners he's had in this race previously, plus thirty three pound fifty to a one pound level stake, and um, Belinska goes extremely well when fresh. He's been off the track for almost ten weeks since that uh, uh, that Newbury defeat in the um, in the Betfair hurdle. So I think he's got a great chance here, sixteen to one. Uh, the other ones to be interested in Roland Ward for um, uh, Kieran Gethings uh, and um, um, so trainer Stuart Edmonds, who had a very sort of difficult start to the uh, season he was out of form Dow uh, for some time but uh, the horses have been running really well now and uh, uh, he, he went off like a scalded cat a couple of runs ago at Faken and was never going to last home and under a more restrained ride uh, he won at entry pretty comfortably so um, he's one of the favorites around about eight to one and at a big price 33 to one or there about scarlet dragon for alan king uh, i'm not a fan of backing alan king horses as a general rule particularly on saturdays at the big, uh, in big races but this one needs a big field and a strong pace you look at his last five wins a uh, number of runners 14 13 14 16 and 16 every time he has a small field tactical affair he gets beat uh, often at short prices he gets his conditions for the first time in ages and he's probably overpriced here so uh, Belinska for me Roland Ward and Scarlet Dragon the other two of interest it's a difficult race isn't it <laughs> um, yeah there's plenty there to uh, make cases for Cormier's 25s as well at the moment correct myself I said 20s so a bit more value but it's uh, definitely not easy that 310 um, that's the only scheduled one for Hey Doc. is there anything else that you like there Carol? No, not at Haydock. I've got someone, something elsewhere, though, if you want that. Yeah, yeah, go on. Um, over, I don't really bet over in Ireland, but uh, in the 315 at Nace, this bear story, um, I don't know what price the horse is going to be. I haven't, I haven't seen anything. But I finished behind this Salamarok, um, Salamarak last time at Leopardstown. This Salamarak has been the talk of the the town since that race, of course. Got up £14, I think, for, for, that, for that win. Um, yeah. This horse finished second and has gone up two pounds. But if you watch the race back, they both come from, exa- they ran identical races. They both came from the exact same position, all come, all, both come wide around the field, and the, the O'Brien horse just finished stronger and beat Bear Story by three lengths. Now, there's people talking Salamarock up for, you know, for a tilt of the Derby or whatever. So he's gone up two pounds. If that performance is as good as the eyes say it is from Salamarock, then this should be winning quite comfortably off this mark of 85. But if this doesn't win, essentially, off, he's basically 12 pounds, or let's say he's nine pounds well in on, on that performance if you go by what the winner has been given a rise. If he's yeah. not winning this, then, you know, perhaps that Salamarok run was too good to be true, if you like. So there's a few avenues, a few reasons to watch 3.15 at NASA. And if you can have a bet, I, there's a couple of O'Brien runners in here. So I, I suspect their story is probably going to be a backable price. So I would take a chance there. Okay. Yeah, for, for Mickey Halford and Ronan Wheel, and I haven't got a price either at the minute. So we'll have to uh, let you know on that. Um, anything for you, Andrew? Anywhere else? Hey, Doc, yeah, anywhere? Yeah, just one at first. In the first race, which is a seller, the 5.30, um, Adrian Nichols has got one called Mo Salita. Um, Nichols has got an incredible record in sellers, uh, seven wins from 17, plus £49.50 to a £1 level stake. I've napped this one last time it ran at Leicester, first run for the yard, straight into a seller. Uh, it was 11 to 4 best price in the morning. Uh, I'll put it up as a two point win bet, 
it's won at an SP of 14 to 1. You can get bigger than 20 to 1 just before the off. I've bet it um, no, with no best odds guaranteed concession. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was handy for the Racing Post naps table position. But, it but you, didn't want it, you didn't want no, it to well, win in the well, end. <laughs> I, I, did, I did have a little bit more on the exchanges, but it was, yeah, you still get sort of mixed feelings. You, all, yeah. all you could do is think about how much extra you would have won had you managed to get BOG, but that's racing. So uh, yeah. what can you do? So yeah, most uh, most a litre in the five thirty. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, "Did I put my starting for the William Hill Naps table and all this?" I was like, "No, I was too busy. I didn't get a chance to send it in." <laughs> um, Any yeah, excuse so, to get that mention in? <laughs> most a litre in the five thirty. Then is a sell it for Andrew. Just eight stone seven as well. Laura Cotland takes off another five. Um, that's it for all the scheduled races then and uh, anything from anywhere else. We just need to uh, pin your sails to a nap. As I've said, mine is Cormier. Uh, I'm going to stick with that about 20 is 25, uh, hopefully. Um, Darrell? It's, it's no no price really turn on the charm, but uh, t- let's let's go um, let's go well hand then. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Tra- uh, well, you, 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 you're trying to go brave with me. Well, Hannah, well, it's just it. you can have turn on the charm. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that turn on the charm should def- should be should be winning. You know, it's really the nap selection, but you know, it's five to four shot, isn't it? It's boring. Uh, well, Han, yeah, I really do like him for that three forty. I do. And we don't want you to be boring on this video, so we'll we'll take the bigger <laughs> prize. Uh, Andrew. I was quite tempted for most Salita in that first seller, but I thought I'd better go uh, a bit more mainstream and go for Carabana in the Victoria Cup 340 at Ascot on Saturday. Yeah, and that'll be a, a nice okay. enough price as well. Uh, that's it then, all the naps and scheduled races. As I said before, um, we'll try and keep you updated with the weather and if selections do not run or change or anything like that. As always, thanks for watching. I hope that we do give you some winners and that you've enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to check out at gg.co.uk for all of those uh, race cards. There's obviously uh, form clues and tips from Daryl and Andrew every single day and uh, loads of other little bits on there for you as well. So do be checking that out. And uh, thanks again for watching. <laughs>